Hello, everyone, and welcome back to um, the Launch Central Command Center here at Delphian. Yeah. yeah. We are clear to remove our helmets. There we right, go. Sure. Oh, you, you left your helmet uh, headlights on. No there problem. you go. You don't want to run out the battery on your spacesuit. They're voice activated. Health <laughs> lights off. <laughs> They didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> They're off, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, because you turned them off with anyway high. Ah, <laughs> uh, you got me. All right, today we are going to be talking about what it takes to be an astronaut. I was brainstorming with Diego last week, like, okay, we've got a few more classes. What do we want to talk about? And he and I talk all the time about these amazing people that work at NASA, that work in, in the other space industries around the world and just how amazingly competent these people are and the amount of education, the amount of training, the amount of experience that they have. Like, do you need a hundred degrees <laughs> in order, you know, a hundred PhDs or hundred master's degrees from colleges in order to go into space? No, but the more you know, the more you can do. Anyway, I was like, let's talk yeah. about this. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a big subject. I think it's a, it's a big life subject. Um, yeah. And one, another friend of mine is uh, Loretta Whitesides from um, Virgin Galactic. So oh, okay. Her husband's CEO of Virgin Galactic. Um, but she has like an entire um, ethos philosophy of how, uh, like what, what it's going to take to put people in space. And like she has an interesting kind of like a Jedi kind of mindset. It's really cool to listen to her talking. Um, kind of what it's going to take to get to space. So really neat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, we're, we're, do we have any new um, viewers today? Uh, oh, let's see. We, we've, we've got a bunch of people in here. I see a lot of familiar uh, names uh, on the list here and in the chat. And Amelia says she's late. Good. Welcome. I'm glad that you got here. We are just beginning our conversation. Um, okay. So What's behind us? <laughs> yeah, so that is the Falcon Heavy rocket, and I stole this um, this footage from a YouTube video from SpaceX where they were getting to launch this thing as a test. Um, you want to test things before you use them for real, and so in here, usually they just put like a chunk of concrete up in the nose in order to test, you know, like, hey, we're launching a satellite or something like that. Well, Elon Musk of SpaceX thought that concrete was boring, so he put his car in there and launched that into space. And that's currently uh, just a little bit past the orbit of Mars right now. So <laughs> a car in space. Welcome if, to 2020. <laughs> if you're looking for your car and you can't find it, um, it might be over by Mars if you parked it near SpaceX. OK, we have Noah. He says he wants to become an astronaut. Yes. Noah? Yes. Yes, you're in thank the right you. place, Noah. I have a feeling that every person watching this webinar has either said out loud or thought to, privately to themselves, I want to be an astronaut someday. Or at least, wouldn't it be cool to go to space? Yeah. And in the early days of human exploration where you know, you, you've, you've got to sail across the Atlantic Ocean, you don't really know exactly what's over there, you know that there's got to be something just because you've done the math and it just kind of makes sense. Uh, they didn't take just any random person and stick them on a ship and send them over the Atlantic. These guys were the top people in their fields at the time. These were the top sailors, the top um, navigators. Astro chart people. Yeah, <laughs> they were the best and brightest at that time uh, in, in order to attempt to accomplish things that had never been accomplished before. Um, you know, Charles Lindbergh crossing the Atlantic on a solo flight. He was one of the top, top, top people in his field. Amelia Earhart doing all these amazing trips around the globe. Um, she had to be extremely experienced. So back in the days, it meant you knew how to fly a plane, how to fix a plane, how to navigate using charts and stuff like that. Before that is you knew a lot about boats but the world is more complicated now and it's tougher to go to space than it is to cross a body of water. So what does it take now? <laughs> Diego's gonna tell us about that. Let's go, let's begin. All right, Evan says concrete is boring. Uh, yes. yes, let's <laughs> stick a car on that rocket. <clears throat> Can you okay. please say hi, Noah? I, uh, no, I will not say hi. Oh no, <laughs> you got hello Noah, welcome. Someone's from the Milky Way. 
good. Yep. Thanks for tuning in. All right. <laughs> good. All Cosmo, right. that's a great name for these space webinars. Yes. yes All right. Yes. Well, we are going to get into the main event here. Diego, you're going to tell us about what it takes to be an astronaut. All right. So let's start off with the definition of an astronaut. And it's, okay. it's simply a person who's trained to travel in space. That's it. Um, right now. Okay. Get, yeah. yeah. Cool. Bye, guys. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> Just get trained to travel in space. Uh, oh, you know, we, we should have made a slide about this, but in America, we call them astronauts. Uh -huh. uh, oh, ast yeah. I actually, that was my intention, is to talk about that. Oh, ding. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's great. Yeah, go ahead. Well, in Russia, they don't call them astronauts. They call them cosmonauts, because that sounds cool. Also, Cosmo is Latin word for Latin for space and the universe. And so here's a person going out and exploring space, exploring the universe. The cosmos. Okay. And I guess in America, we just wanted our own name for it. So we call it astronauts. <laughs> right. I should actually probably do some more research. Feel I, free to I, look this uh, up Yeah, yourself. I looked that up. Okay, it good. Was the there was some debate about it because the, the Russians were beating uh, Americans to space. And, you know, they were, the, the Russians made some amazing gains for all of mankind. Yeah. And, um, you know, we kind of like said, well, yeah, we're going to do our own thing and, you know, uh, change the word too. So we have cosmonauts, astronauts, and China has taikonauts. Taikonauts, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so you got all these different, uh, these different words. Basically, if you're trained in the United States, you're an astronaut. Um, and even Canadians, they're astronauts as well. <laughs> all right. Um, so next slide. I, I, oh, just, good, good. I, I like Sarah's input here. She says, America is unique. We have a weird measurement system and a weird name for <laughs> dude in space. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're good for the next one. All right. I have this here we quote. Go. So this great quote on what is an astronaut. And I think it's summed up by the science fiction writer Robert Heinlein. Um, but here's his quote. A human being should be able to change a diaper plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, that means control a ship, basically be able to navigate a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, which is a, a poem, poetry, song, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. So that's by Robert Heinlein. But that I love this quote because it kind of gives you the breadth of competence of an astronaut. You know, this, this quote isn't specifically about um, an astronaut, but it's what a human being should be able to do. And if you can check off on any of those, you're, you're on your way. And I think that you I can check off a few of those. Yeah, yeah. I know I've changed diapers. <laughs> I know I've pitched I've manure. Diapers too. <laughs> I know I've taken and given orders. Uh -huh. Man, if we could just make that a checklist. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you could do all those things and you set that in a checklist, you'd be on your way. There we go. Oh, plan an invasion. Yep. Yeah, plan an invasion. <laughs> my, my brother had cookies in his room. I wanted them. He didn't want me to have them. It was a thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Get the cookies from the brother. Uh, yeah. There's so many things though to touch on. And I think that's the, the essence of what an astronaut is, is competence. It's, uh, and, um, competence. What is competence? It's being able to do things. It's being good at stuff. Um, just look in your room right now, wherever you're viewing this and you have, yeah, like I'm looking over there at the doorknob. Can I change a doorknob? Can I take it apart, put it back together? If it breaks, can I reinstall another one? Yes. And, and those little insights, they give you um, knowledge into other insights. And it makes changing something else easier. That makes sense. You know? So James, I'm gonna give you a challenge. In okay. Here. I'm challenging everybody at home, but I want you to follow along with me. Um, take a look down the room and tell me something in the room that you're competent at. Okay, good. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm looking at the setup that we have for our webinar here. Uh -huh. We've got the laptop, we've, we've got the camera, we've got the microphone, we've got various wires connecting everything. We've got our ethernet cable connecting us to the internet. 
I feel like I uh, could competently set this all up and break it down and set it back up and break it down because I have. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I feel that's very awesome. confident about that's that. That's awesome. Now, and I have not. So sometimes I'm like, James, come in like, here. Like, what do we yeah. do? Oh, oh, it's fine. You just plug this thing in yeah, here. Yeah. Now, let's say our microphone broke. Uh-huh. I would not feel that I could competently take the microphone apart, see what was wrong inside, fix it, and put it back together. And, and that's where astronauts have to be able to take parts of their spaceship and put things back together. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Something like a, you know, a broken microphone could be a real problem in space. If, you're, if you need to talk to mission control back on Earth and you're up in space, your microphone breaks, you got to be able to reestablish communication. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's get into some of the, the base. So our next slide is some of the basic requirements that let you uh, submit your application for being an astronaut. Good. Um, it, th there's a few uh, things. Oh, I think people are writing in what are they competent at? So oh, competent oh, at yeah, painting. Right. Moises is competent at sleeping. That, <laughs> that's an important skill. If you're not well rested, you're going to make mistakes. Oh, I, I want to talk about that real quick. Sleeping. Okay. Um, when you're astronauts a lot of times they when they do spacewalks they have the ability of basically a person who is under the influence of alcohol because the night before they do their spacewalk most astronauts not all of them but most astronauts are so nervous mm. that they don't get enough sleep and so they do these tests on them and um, they find out that they're basically when astronauts are going out and fixing things on they have their, their perception, their, they might be a little tired. Because when you only get two hours We of sleep, all know what it feels like to be super tired. Yeah. It's really hard to operate. And they've done the tests, and basically it's like a person who's operating under like the influence of a couple beers. That and, is, and it's not that the, the astronauts have drank. Of course not. They haven't I'm, drank anything, but they're- I'm sure it doesn't even exist on the space station. Right, that's right. But they've, but they're, they, they have that type of- um, uh, That hand-eye coordination yeah, they, and the, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah. So being able to sleep is a competence thing that, I mean, if you can like, okay, I got a spacewalk tomorrow and you get a full eight hours, that is awesome. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and I don't think I have that. <laughs> uh, uh, Ethan's competent at coding a computer. Isis awesome. at reading and writing. A less competent at reading her books. It's huge. The ability to read unlocks everything else in life. Uh, Henry is... Comment at shooting bugs with a shotgun. Good. Excellent. <laughs> Milo's comment at computer setup. Noah is at building forts. Aubrey can sew. She has a sewing kit. Oh, oh huge. Big one. Yeah. Big one. Yep. Uh, Brando's competent at basketball. Oh, man. It just keeps going and going. Yes. You, you guys are amazing. I'm sure that – I'm sorry if I didn't get a chance to read your thing, but well done on being competent at those things. I, I encourage you to – become that competent at as many things as possible. All right. All right. So, so what does it take? Now, so are there any actual requirements to become an astronaut for the United States, for, for NASA? Um, yeah, we're going to get into those. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they, here, here they are. So it's U.S. US citizenship. Okay. Um, and we have a bachelor's. So to be a, an astronaut now, Canadians like um, Chris Hadfield, Canadian Space Agency, when he got, it, it, that was very rare at the time when he got in, like he had a one in a bazillion chance of making that, like his story is amazing. Um, but you can be from other countries, but then you have to partner, your country has to partner with the United States to be in their astronaut corps. Yeah, Canada they, is very closely partnered yeah, yeah, for sure. with the United States. For sure. Um, so bachelor's degree in engineering, biological sciences, physical sciences, or mathematics. Mathematics from a, an accredited college or university. So some type of STEM degree, science, technology, um, engineering, mathematics. So, okay. That's science what, and math. Yeah, science and math. You can't have enough you science and math. Uh, <laughs> you never know which kind of math you're going to need up there. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And and math is the language that helps you understand science. Yeah. And you know when when you run into that that makes I, that's the biggest barrier to studying sciences is understanding the math that I found with 
educating students like because they'll they'll have like some science problem that they have to figure out but it requires them to look at graphs and to, to understand those formulas and what what the different lines are doing and so that depends on your ability to understand math the language of science that's awesome uh very important question for you from lorna have you ever been to space no <laughs> do you want to go to space i definitely want to be, go to space me too yeah yeah and i i want to be an astronaut when i grow up <laughs> that's yes. still very true yes okay yes. good so, so these are official requirements for nasa right yeah. all right what else here um so three years of related professional experience after obtaining the bachelor's degree or at least a thousand hours in jet aircraft as the pilot in command okay so let's break that down really mm -hmm. quick um so after you go to college and get a at least one degree mm -hmm. probably a few more in some math or science thing you then need to go and work for three years in that field yeah 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 so that makes you sense know, you know if you're if you're a medical doctor three years in there you know because if you just study the theory and filled out the bubbles again nasa wants competence they want people who can do things who can get the job done. yeah i don't want to go up to the space station have something happen like oh no i broke my leg and a guy comes along don't worry i'm a doctor I, i'll set this leg for you i, I mean I, i've read about how to set this leg i i watched a lot of Grey's anatomy so it'll be fine it'll be fine yeah, yeah. I, I would not feel comfortable with that i would want like yeah i worked for three years at in the new york uh, hospitals and yeah, yeah. Set hundreds of broken legs let's do this yeah yeah exactly I, I know how to yeah. draw blood i we can send whatever back to houston and we can yep there we go send information and talk or at least a thousand hours in jet aircraft as the pilot in command yeah if you're going to be flying my space shuttle uh -huh. i want to know that you can fly and that you've proved it over and over <laughs> and over again yeah yeah, yeah. They, as, as, as you as you become a trained pilot you learn a lot of this technical field how spacecraft is oriented there's different uh, mm -hmm. language that talks about how um, objects are moved around and so in order to understand uh, flight off outside the planet in order to understand all that you have to understand how it behaves on in normal atmosphere that makes sense you're not going to drive a race car before you drive <laughs> regular cars a lot yeah yeah yeah. Uh, we have a few people in the comment section telling us that we have already grown up. No, I don't think so. Um, There's so much to learn. <laughs> that, that, that concept of being a grown up, like, are we adults and, and we have careers and families? Yes, all that. Um, I'm not done learning. I'm not done adjusting what I want to do in life and making new goals and chasing after them. And, you know, I remember being in school and me and my friends, we were just like, man, one day I want to do this. One day I want to do this. One day I want to do this. And we just set these goals. We set these dreams. And then we start to align the stuff in our life to go after them. And, you know, if grow, if being grown up means not creating new goals and dreams and chasing after them passionately, then I don't ever want to grow up. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I want to be Peter Pan here. Yeah. So I, I, I say that a, a little bit jokingly, but <laughs> Just that concept of you're always pushing for the next thing, the next thing, and having a challenge and a game to play with yourself. I want to obtain this. I want yeah. to attain, you know, just, we, we've all been at home for like the last two months now, not really able to go out and do new stuff. I was like, you know, it's time to learn volleyball. I've been watching volleyball for 15 years. It's time to actually start playing it myself. Oh, cool. And <laughs> so that I set that new goal. And, you know, in the last month, I've gotten a lot better than I was before. <laughs> That's awesome. So, yeah, even Alan Bean, who uh, was on Apollo 16 or 17. So this guy was a moonwalker. He landed on the moon, walked on the moon, came back, trained himself into a painter and spent the last years of his life practicing painting. He has these amazing moonscapes um, because yep. his eyes were up there and he wanted to capture that same beauty. Yeah. So when I say I want to be an astronaut when I grow up, <laughs> I know what I'm saying. And I know it's <laughs> technically not totally correct. And I choose to disagree with that. <laughs> okay. So the second half of what's uh, written here, go ahead. Yeah. Advanced degrees may be substituted for professional experience according to the following formula. A master's degree equals one year of experience and a doctorate equals three years. So um, basically, if you have more schooling, 
um, you can substitute that for professional experience. So if you have five different degrees, then you know they just assume that you can uh, that that counts as some of your yeah professional experience. But because you can't just get a master's degree just by sitting and studying. It requires a lot of actual doing stuff in the field that you're trying to get a degree in and even more so for a doctorate degree if you can say like i have a phd in mechanical engineering yeah good programs will have you doing a lot you're gonna do a lot lot. of things yeah yeah you're probably gonna end up with you know at least or three or more years of experience real experience in that area so let's go on the next one um, so this one's completion of the NASA long duration space flight physical exam. Applicants must demonstrate distant and near visual acuity correctable to 2020 in each eye and must not have blood pressure that exceeds 140 over 90 measured in the sitting position. Okay. What does that mean? Let's break that down. Let's break it down. So you got to be able to see, you got to be able to see, or at least your vision's correctable. LASIK was invented to correct, um, pilots, uh, vision. LASIK so that, where you... Yeah, they shoot your eye with a laser with very laser. specifically and scientifically, and it makes it so you have better eyesight and don't need glasses. Yeah, yeah. So, you, so your vision has to be corrected. Um, I was bummed out when I was in middle school because I remember hearing that being an astronaut, you had to have good vision, and I didn't have good vision. But the uh, but it was just it just has to be correctable, which now it's even easier. Mm-hmm. Back in those days, it wasn't well known that you could correct vision. <laughs> now it, you're you're wearing contacts. I'm wearing glasses. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's pretty good. If I were going into space, I would probably want to get LASIK so that I didn't need contacts or didn't need glasses, and I could just be up there without them. Um, what if you know I break my glasses up there. I got to duct tape them together and just say like, you're up there and you're trying to, <laughs> you know, fix the Hubble Space Telescope yeah. and your glasses, you One know. One barrier you the, don't the, want in your way. The tape starts to peel off of your yeah. glasses. And even, uh, even now, astronauts that go to space, um, their eyes will swell and distort. And so um, even with correction, sometimes astronauts have vision problems when mm-hmm. they come back to Earth. Yep. Oh, um, ISIS is, is, is asking, what does doctorate mean? So w- when you go to college, there's a few different levels of degrees that, that you can get. And, and you know, each level is, takes more time and it's more difficult and, it's, and it, it's, it's more significant than the next one. Yeah, so roughly you finish <laughs> high school, then you get your bachelor's degree. You're like two years? Um, four years, four, year, four years commonly, but some people can finish it in two years. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. a lot of, some programs don't have a time limit on it. Um, other programs you have to do time. So <laughs> it just depends. Yep. So you have your bachelor's, your master's and your PhD. Bachelor's is usually PhD being doctorate. Right. Right. Okay. So bachelor's is usually about four years. Master's is an additional two years. Depends on the program mm-hmm. and then PhD up to another four years. Good. So it just depends on the program. Good. Uh, Isis, thank you for that question. Good question. Um, and, and Jolly says, when they go, don't they train underwater to simulate the Oh, we're going to get into floating? that. Yes, yes. Yeah. We're, Let's we're get definitely going to talk basic about that. Exa- the basic uh, qualifications. Yep. So the next one. Um, All right, good. So uh, your eyesight needs to be? 2020. Yep. And, and must I have blood pressure that exceeds 140 over 90 measured in a sitting position? You know, that's, if your blood pressure is too high or too low, it can mean that you've got some medical stuff going on, or it could just mean that your body isn't in the best shape to go to space right now. Yeah. Right. Right. And um, (laughs) here's a challenge at home. Find if you know, if your parent might know how to take blood pressure and maybe they have, maybe someone around has the equipment to do so learn how to take people's blood pressure yeah so get the get the equipment it's usually a, a band that goes around um the arm or there's uh things that are on your finger and you could even um there's some apps on phones that do stuff if you have the right type of watch ask ask adults in your area and they can um help you figure out how to take blood pressure yeah and i wonder if they still have those things i remember going to the store going to the pharmacy when my mom is shopping, my brother and I are just at that machine and it, you put your arm, it's got a little, yeah, yeah, in it, and yeah. it takes your blood pressure and that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Figure out how to do those. Cause that it's, it's, 
and it's good data to know. Yeah, Evan's asking, what does 140 over 90 mean? That That's a measurement um, showing what the pressure of your blood is. How how hard is your heart pumping? How fast is your blood moving? And um, if those numbers go too high, it means that you, your blood is moving way too strong and that that can be not great. You know, if it's too low, it's not moving fast enough. So yep. there's an average there. Yep. Oh, can person. we define acuity? Acuity. So um, being able to uh, see things precisely. That's all. So being able to um, make, to be able to see, have high resolution. Good. All right. All right. Good. So and Lily's asking, I know we're, we're getting a little off topic <laughs> right now, but this is a really important question. What if you get sick in space? Oh, well, that's, that's why astronauts need to have a lot of competence. If, if, if me and James are in space, James gets sick, I gotta be able to like <laughs> help him out. I gotta be able to get him the stuff that he needs to get the sickness over. I gotta know how to get him quarantined mm -hmm. and different things like that. We don't want everyone on the International Space Station <laughs> yeah. getting, get, getting the flu or getting other kinds of sick. And while, while we're being quarantined maybe for the first time in our lives, each of us, this is not unusual to astronauts. An astronaut will quarantine for, I forget how long, at least a week or something like that before they go to space, just to make sure like if they're sick with something, they're gonna give it enough time so that that shows up before they send them up. So that you don't send a guy who's, you know, about to get sick in two days, you launch him, then he gets sick. So, yeah, yep. All right. <clears throat> You also, there, there is a height requirement. You need to be 62 to 75 inches. And uh, for those of you who use the metric system, that's 175 and a half centimeters to 190 and a half centimeters. Well, that's the American, that's the NASA requirement. And that's not because shorter people or taller people aren't as good at the math and science <laughs> and, and the different fields that are necessary. It's just spacesuits are really complicated and they can tailor the spacesuits pretty good for people within a range of height, but um, they, they don't have super small or super tall spacesuits. Yeah. So you must be this tall <laughs> to ride <laughs> on a rocket. I didn't see you put this in. Diego That's didn't funny. know that I added that. I added that right before we started. I'm refreshing <clears> the screen. <laughs> All right. Okay, so this is this is the uh, this is the job this is the usjobs.gov website. Um, it's not a big mystery, but you you just apply to this just like a, a regular federal job. Um, right now, I did a search on this just yesterday, and you could see that um, they are not hiring astronauts right now. <laughs> it just closed. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, it just closed for astronauts. So there's a window where you. Uh, when you can apply. Um, I have, I know two people who applied to be astronauts. We give a shout out, Andre Stewart. And, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on her name right now. Uh, oh Aaron, no. Yeah. Aaron, I want to say, I'll, I'll, I'll think of it in a second. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> and, and he will be sending an apology. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Says the guy who's like famous for forgetting names and faces. Yeah. Uh, oh, someone asked, uh, Mimi was asking, is it the same height requirements for women? Yeah, same height requirements. Um, again, it's just the logistics of building spacesuits that can fit the, the right size of people. Lily's asking, what would you do if you run out of food? This is one of the reasons why, even if you're not going to be an astronaut, you're not going to be the person going to space, but you're in NASA or you're in another space agency that is on the ground supporting the people that go to space. For every one person that goes to space, it takes thousands of people, if not more, to make that happen. And your math needs to be really good. You can't be the person who's planning all the, all the meals and the menus of what your astronauts are gonna eat. You send them up and be like, oh, I forgot Tuesday. <laughs> Just don't eat on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, uh, Wednesday's hamburgers, Tuesday. <laughs> is a diet day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, you, you, you've got to do the math correctly and they always have extra food. Yeah. Um, they always assume that, they have to assume that the next 
supply craft with their next food and water and you know extra oxygen and stuff like that they have to assume that the next one's not going to come it'll blow up on on launch or something will go wrong they they have a lot of extra supplies there and they can go a long time without resupply yeah good um the next slide <laughs> this is the happy fact that i like to point out is that even though there was you saw zero astronauts needed right now they're they're we're in need of how many hundred nasa employees this is just NASA. Let's see, 61 different individual jobs available. Across, across the country, even despite the shutdowns right now, they need to fill 61 positions at NASA. Yep. Um, and then you add to all the different companies that are doing things in aerospace. And there's just so many opportunities to work in the aerospace industry. Did you know that there's truck drivers that are needed to deliver spaceships? I did. Wait a second. Wait, are you saying that my job could be spaceship delivery guy? Yeah. That, <laughs> so, it, it, and that, um, being able to do that doesn't require um, a college degree and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So there's, there's so many ways to be employed in the aerospace industry if you want to be part of that game. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, when we started doing this, it was like, you know, because being an astronaut is like a sky high goal. And I, I, <laughs> I really, <laughs> he didn't mean to, <laughs> I really, you know what I mean? So yeah, even if you, um, even if you can't make that star high goal, <laughs> you have other options. Okay, that was on available. purpose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have, you have a lot of, uh, other options available that there's just so many things from welding to sewing to, I mean, just, it's, it's crazy the yep. amount of jobs. All right, so Evan is asking, is there an age requirement? To my knowledge, there is not, but um, you do need to, again, there, there are certain requirements on height. So, you know, your son two years ago would not have met the height requirement. <laughs> your son now does <laughs> yeah. um, because he, you know, got taller yeah. as, as he grew. Uh, you need certain college degrees or, a, you know, and that, that amount of time and experience in a field that takes time. Yeah. So the federal employees eight, 18 years old. Okay. So 18 yeah. years old, but I don't think you're going to find someone with a college degree and three years of experience in a field who isn't 18 yet. Yeah. Um, and if you do, if there is someone like that, please, please, please <laughs> send me their contact information. I have to interview this person and find yeah. out like, how did they do it? What did you do? <laughs> Uh, good. So Lorna says they need to have a garden on the ISS, on the International Space Station. You're right. And other people just as intelligent as you had that same idea and put a garden on the International Space Station where they're doing a lot of exper experiments. <clears throat> it's uh, an experiment that get, gets you experience. <laughs> New word. Uh, to, Damn. <laughs> yeah, to find out what what does it take to grow plants in space? Do they grow the same? Do they grow differently? What happens if you take the seeds of something, send the seeds to space and expose them to the to zero gravity and the, the, radiation, the extra radiation yeah. that you're gonna have up there? And what happens if you bring them back to earth and grow them? Do they grow differently than the same, than, than tomato seeds that did not go up? We've done that experiment. We, now we didn't send the seeds, but Diego, you got space tomato seeds yeah, from so NASA. From Tomato Sphere. So it's the Tomato Sphere. It's a nonprofit. Um, they are seeds that you can plant in your classroom. Um, and they basically, they, it was a science experiment where you can have. Um, experiment. You can have seeds that are, uh, been exposed to space and seeds that are here and, and you can test it in your own classroom mm -hmm. to see which one grows more. Or, and you grow them side by side. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. What, what were your observations? Not a whole lot of difference. Okay. The, the, yeah. <laughs> and now we know, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's exciting. Um, okay. Lorna says, Diego, sign up for a job at NASA. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> my, my thing is I want to do the most important thing that I can um, in the world. And although I think space is very important, I think right now education is one of the most important things for the future of mankind. So I've dedicated my life to being an educator. So um, thank you here at Delphian. And you know, I, 
there's a lot of people, you know, there, you see, you, you'll hear a lot of celebrities and people and scientists. And, um, you know, I was at a conference and I met this well driller who's, you know, making a bazillion dollars. And he, he goes, you know, I wish I would have been like digging for oil. Yeah. 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 Uh, he said, you know, I wish I would have been a teacher because it's, it's a cool job. You get to work with the future every day. And, you see these kids like we, we just had a student yeah. that is uh, got a mechanical engineering degree at JPL came from a job. Yeah. Job. Yeah. Yep. Like, yeah. And she came from Delphi and, and we're just like so proud. And so you're like proud of her. You, we're making the kids that are going to be doing things uh, in space that are going to be, you know, I, I always tell teachers um, that I know at Johnson Space Center, one day our kids are going to be put boots on Mars. Like, yeah, education's important. <laughs> Specific space science boots. Yes, yep. yes. Uh, so, great question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I was intentionally walking him into that statement. <laughs> I knew what he was going to say and why, and I felt like it was really important. Yeah. Uh, Noah's asking, do you have to work out and be strong to be an astronaut? Well, let's get into yeah. it. Yeah. Let's get into Good. it. Good. Some of the, um, so one of the things is scuba. Uh, if you know, if you're comfortable underwater and you know how to uh, scuba dive already, you already have this checkbox marked. Um, you know, even just getting a mask on and being comfortable underwater. Um, I was with the Space Foundation. We did some training where we had um, plastic pipes set up and we had to dive under the water and assemble things with gloves on. So it was like simulating how astronauts train. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, uh, astronauts have a lot of underwater training because you're in an environment where you're having to breathe artificially. It's just like space. So yep. all those little skills, knowing and, how to- And set. there's a lot of restrictions. Your nose itches, <laughs> too bad. Yeah, You yeah. are not taking off your mask to scratch your nose or to rub your eye or anything like that. Yeah. All astronauts are rated scuba divers, so they they can and rated just means that they they're um, qualified. They've spent so many hours under. They yeah. prove that they're competent at at scuba diving. Yep. Um, this is a photo. Um, I'm training with some students that I took to uh, uh, Johnson Space Center, um, Space Center Houston. Uh, they have a program called Space U. Um, if you come to Delphian, we have this option where we can send you to Space U. So um, right before this COVID, we had a couple students that were lined up to go to Space U and we had to pull the plug on that. But um, we are partnering with Space Center Houston to um, get them to, uh, to get them to their camp and work with our students to get um, to be in their wonderful program. Uh, this is my son on the very far left, Emilio. Um, he got to do some scuba training for the first time. So very cool. These are some other students from Colorado. I was working with the STEM program in the summer. Um, and so I had an opportunity to get them all there. So we got some cool things coming. That's so cool. <laughs> Angelica says that her class planted space tomatoes. The experiment that we talked yeah. about, they also did, and they tasted them. Uh, Angelica, I would love to know how they tasted. Did they taste any different or did they taste the same? <laughs> I will look for your answer in the comments here. Cool. And Noah's asking a bit more on do you need, how physically fit do you need to be and do you need to work out in space? We're not going to spend, we're getting short on time. We've got about five minutes left. So we're not going to talk a lot about that. But yes, you have to work out in space. Astronauts work out, what, about two hours two a day? Two hours a day. You have, requirements. Yeah, you have to work out. And they've got very special equipment up there to, uh, you know, there, there, there's no gravity. So it's very easy to lift weights. I could bench press Diego, <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah. So, so there's like, you gotta like strap yourself into bungee cords so that it's like pulling and you're pushing against it. Um, so we don't have a lot of time to talk <laughs> about better, that. We better jam. Yep, yep. Okay. Uh, next. Next. <clears throat> so uh, pilot training, we talked about that a little bit. Um, uh, I've always looked for programs where we can teach um, students to fly. Yeah, so, so these are some of my students back in Colorado. Um, Is that Emilio? Yeah. That's, <laughs> <laughs> these are some students. They, these students all got um, their first flight in a glider. So we were in Moriarty, New Mexico, and we were flying these gliders. Wow. Um, it was amazing. So, and students got to take the wheel and a glider uh, gets pulled by another plane. 
you detach and then you catch these things called thermals, which are hot air that comes up from the desert and it pushes your plane up. These planes can fly 300 or more miles without using a drop of gasoline. That's and so, so cool. a lot of astronauts, they get glider certified. Yep. And you can get your glider pilot's license at a very young age. I think as young as 12 or 14. So wow. it's really, it's really, uh, there's some competence available there. And that's good to know because when the space shuttle would come back in from space and land, it was not on engine power. You yeah. could not like turn on the engines and make it go faster. That you have thing to came know. in as a glider. Yeah, yeah. You and if you know. get it wrong, there's no circling <laughs> around to come back again. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have some more data from Angelica here about those space tomatoes. She said, I think everyone thought different, but I thought they tasted the same. <laughs> okay, cool. That, that's, that's really good to know. Cool. Let's, let's uh, talk about this next guy that can kill you and bring you back to life. <laughs> and this is Navy SEAL. He can he, save you a so, hundred different ways. Yeah, he's a Navy SEAL. Okay, so Navy SEALs are just, you know, research what a Navy SEAL can do. They're pretty amazing. They are the uh, military trained military people. Yeah, military. Yeah. I mean, these guys can go in and swim through miles, like literally swim through miles of stuff and do things underwater at night. I mean, these guys are just crazy, competent So people. good. On so, top of that, he's a doctor. <laughs> from Harvard. <laughs> from Harvard. <laughs> Harvard and that's doctor. the guy that got accepted to be an astronaut. Yeah. And that's that who Diego would have been applying against. <laughs> Diego is an incredible person. He's done amazing things, and he's got a lot going on. Yeah. But you're not a Navy SEAL. No. <laughs> and you're not a doctor from Harvard. <laughs> no. Yeah, so Navy SEAL, Harvard doctor, and now a NASA astronaut. Um, this guy is 35 years old. He's accepted into the... Oh, someone's asking, are these the same people? Yes. Yeah, yeah, the same yep. guy. Same guy. His name is Johnny Kim. Um, and he changed his career three times. And he's the first Korean-American astronaut. So we're wow. looking forward to all the stuff that he's going to do and um, discovery, discoveries that he's going to make and the contributions he's going to have on NASA that he's already had. It's going to be great. I would yeah. feel very comfortable going to space with Dr. Kim as, as <laughs> yeah. one of my expedition crew members. Yes. yes. You know, like you break, your, uh, you break your leg, you get a <laughs> splinter in your thumb, you know, no one better take the splinter out of your thumb than this guy, I'll bet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, let's talk about the neutral buoyancy lab. Uh, what does that mean? I'm wearing that shirt today. This is my shirt from the neutral buoyancy lab. There it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, neutral buoyancy lab. Um, we got. Uh, what does that mean? Um, it's a lab. It's thousands of gallons under uh, in Space Center Houston. Good picture um, of that. The entire. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there the, it is. The entire space station is underneath um is underneath this pool and that's where they dunk astronauts in and they practice doing maneuvers it's the closest that we can simulate to zero gravity right neutral buoyancy neutrally buoyant meaning you know that they have you're you're in a suit that's weighted in such a way that you're not going to go up or down you're going to stay level in the water wherever you are yeah. to simulate being <clears throat> as closely as possible on earth being in space with zero gravity. Yeah, you've all been in a pool, you have goggles on, you swim upside down, you're flowing. Yeah, that, yep. it's, it's been, it, that's the way to, to, to experience zero G, the closest mm -hmm. thing that we can get. Right you've been now. in there, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we have a question from Mackenzie and Denali. Is the pool cold? Um, no, they keep it pretty warm. I forget the exact temperature, but it's like body temperature. Um, yeah, they keep it heated. Um, so that way people are comfortable in there because they have a, a lot of the trainers that got that we got to work with their Navy SEALs. So you're like, you have a Navy SEAL. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so in the background, this is uh, right here. This is a helicopter simulator. So when we were there, we jumped in that thing, they dunked us, and then we had to escape out the windows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it simulated like a helicopter crashing in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. the water. Yeah, so, um, so this is the world's biggest dunk tank. Yeah, yeah, it's basically like a giant dunk tank. And awesome. so I was part of this group of teachers that went and did this in the summer. Daniel Newmeyer, Space Center Houston, 
Um, he helped put this together for teachers. And so that way they could take this experience, come back to the classroom and, um, and teach their students. So, I want in, man. Yeah, Where do I yeah. sign up? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we are out of time oh. here. I know we're out of time, but we have more stuff. So we're going to click through a few things really quickly, but Milo has the most important question okay. of the decade. Uh, do, do, does a lava lamp work in zero gravity? Does the lava lamp work in zero gravity? All right, so let's just break that down real quick. I'm going to say <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm gonna say no. The the what's going on inside a lava lamp is it's heating up one thing, and when it heats up, it expands, and that makes it lighter than the material around it. So it goes up because lighter stuff uh, goes on top of 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 heavier stuff. So it appears that it's going up, but actually the heavier stuff around it is going down, and that pushes it up. But there's no down in space; it's just zero gravity. So I'm gonna say no. But Milo. Why don't you uh, become a Navy SEAL and doctor from Harvard? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm kind of joking a bit. But, you know, if you wanted to pursue being an astronaut, there's nothing stopping you. Go for it and take a lava lamp up to space. Yeah. And then we will have you as the guest of honor on one of our future webinars, and you can tell us about it. Cool. Okay, we are out of time. Here's a really cool picture with Diego and some people. Yeah, these are these are my buddies. <laughs> so these are my buddies. Um, one this thing will be the last thing, a final okay. shout out. One thing yeah. to note is that there's a, a lot of people come from small towns um, because they grow up running um, tractors. They go, grow up running um, equipment. Um, and when you're out on a farm, you can't run to the store and buy things. You have to improvise and do things. So a lot of those skill sets that where people grow up in rural areas, they have to apply those to the to being an astronaut. You're isolated, you only got what you have with you. We gotta go to the next time. Let's figure it out. Okay, <laughs> next time. Uh, uh, yeah, so- Russians yeah. crashed and fought bears. Yeah, so the survival <laughs> training. Tune in with um, James for his emergency training um, because the more competence on the way. Next. And this is my friend Andre Stewart. Uh, they He was part of the high seas program where they spent a year on a Hawaiian mountain. Um, Pretending to be on Mars. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he has some amazing stuff. Look at look up him in the high seas mission. Here's him having a cup of coffee in a space. That doesn't work. Anytime they went outside their Mars simulation, they had to have spacesuits on. And so uh, I got to work with him in the bottom bottom right hand corner. We were able to. Oh, Lauren is asking, did that actually happen? Where Russians crashed and had to fight bears? Literally, that happened. <laughs> I'm not joking. They yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, if you haven't read this book from Chris Hadfield, uh, he is one of the most extraordinary people of the last hundred years. Find it, read his book. Yeah. He has so much to teach you about life on earth from what he learned in space. Yeah. Learn about astronauts. If you want to become an astronaut, F yeah. figure out their career path, their career paths were all slightly different. Here's my students. All right. Sienna, Heidi, Quinn. These he are Delphian students at that just rocked it at this science fair, multiple science fairs, got awards from, you know, the US Navy or Air Force and NASA. Both, <laughs> Both. fine, good. Um, anyway, Diego, we're just gonna have to talk separately about science about fair science stuff. Fair. Yeah, New science fair. Okay, good. <laughs> Man. All right. Okay, yeah, we're way out of time. Promo code. <laughs> are we, are we, do Listen. We have I don't know. Someone was asking, you know, like, okay, so um, are there going to be future webinars? Because I mentioned that Milo could join us as our guest of honor after he comes back with, you know, the amazing lava lamp experiment of 2025. Yeah. Uh, there are going to be more, the, the, there is going to be more coming after these webinars end this week. Um, if you haven't already, go and register for the grand finale that's going to be happening Friday at 2.30, from 2.30 to 3.15 Pacific time. And um, we're, we're gonna be making some announcements on there about kind of what's coming, what's next. We're excited to continue to uh, share this experience, this experience with you and to learn more and help you learn more. All right, gotta go. Here we go. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. We're going to see you on the next webinars. Goodbye.